Welcome to chapter 10, where we're going to uh, wrap up the year, and uh, have, we're going to have a good recap on um, shapes and polarities here. We're going to apply polarities throughout this unit. Um, here are your learning objectives. We're going to talk about intermolecular forces, um, the forces that are between molecules versus intramolecular forces, which are the forces within a molecule. Um, so we looked a lot about, looked at a lot at shapes and figured out how if I have a molecule all by itself, it can be a polar molecule with negative and positive ends. Um, and these are partially negative and partially positive ends um, because they're just polar. But our focus is what happens when two of those come together um, we really get um, this section hmm. find the highlighter here um, we really get this section here where between the molecules how do they line up and how are they attracted to one another you can see they're attracted when the positives and the negatives come together and then they repel when the negatives and the negatives come together. So they, they, they arrange themselves all throughout this structure to try and maximize those attractions and minimize those repulsions between all of the molecules. Um, so to do that, we need to see what molecules are polar and nonpolar and what their shapes are. Um, H2 is our most simple diatomic. It looks like this. That's an I. Let's pretend that's an H. Um, It is linear, nonpolar, um, and it's as simple as it gets, except for individual atoms, a little easier, I guess. Um, pH 3, our Lewis structure is this. Phosphorus can have three bonds. Each hydrogen gets one. Um, and this is a polar molecule, trigonal pyramidal. This is polar. So it's, we say two different things here. It is a polar molecule, and then this other part is it exhibits dipole-dipole forces. Okay, let me highlight that. So when you get two pH3s together, those polar things, the forces we call them, are dipole forces, the forces between the two different pH3s. Um, hydrogen is not going to do that because it's not polar. Dipole means polar. Carbon dioxide is another one. Carbon is allowed to have four bonds. Each oxygen is allowed to have two. So hopefully we remember this structure. It is linear and nonpolar, so it will not exhibit dipole forces. H2S is like H2O. It will be bent. Polar, this will give us dipole forces. If I get two different H2S's together, between them they will have polar attractions, dipole-dipole forces. SF4 is a little trickier um, because it's going to require us to draw a non-standard breaking the octet rule shape. Keeping track of all the electrons here, there are 34 electrons, um, but we're going to need 40 to make all of those octets. Um, that is going to give us a difference of six, which is only three bonds. Um, so we actually, we don't want that. Remember, we just want this 34 electrons. We need to keep track of that number when we break the octet rule here. Um, so we put our sulfur in the middle. And then if I, I'm going to think ahead a little here. If I have four fluorines, each one holds eight electrons. That will be 32. There is room for two more on the sulfur. So we put the extra electrons on the central atom. Um, and if we can think that far ahead, then we draw the shape accordingly. And we get this seesaw shape, trigonal bipyramidal geometry, or electron geometry, but then a seesaw molecular geometry. Um, this, we have to know these shapes because this is, again, this is a polar molecule. So it will exhibit dipole-dipole forces, polar versus nonpolar. The molecules themselves can be polar or nonpolar, but when you get two molecules together, they have intermolecular forces between them. 
Um, and then when we get into hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonding is a little tricky because hydrogen bonding, I always want to write that in parentheses, hydrogen bonds because they're not really bonds. It's an intermolecular force. It is a misnomer to say that it is a bond. Okay, so if we look at this Lewis structure over here, inside the water, there's an H2O. Well, I have hydrogen-oxygen bonds. Okay, this is not a hydrogen bond. This is a hydrogen-oxygen bond within the molecule. We come over here and we can see it in the methanol, the CH3OH. I have a, an oxygen-hydrogen bond, but that is not what we're talking about. That's a bond within the molecule. When we're talking about hydrogen bonding, they're not bonds. It's the forces between the molecules. So when two waters get together, it's this oxygen here, the red oxygen, connected um, intermolecularly with this hydrogen. That's the attraction. Um, over here, this is my hydrogen, quote unquote, bond. They're not bonds. Um, the attraction between the two different molecules. So it's really important that you can identify and coordinate where those hydrogen bonds are between the molecules. Um, and we don't ne necessarily have to have oxygen. Remember, we can have nitrogen or fluorine as well. The electronegative elements will do that. They're not bonds. They're not bonds. Those are between. So, which of the following will exhibit hydrogen bonds? And remember, the attraction between two different ones. So here I have HBr. Um, there is a hydrogen there. It is polar, but it is not hydrogen bonding polar, because I need nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. So this one is out just based on the identity of what's in it. NH3 looks like uh, a good option. We draw the structure and I have nitrogen attached to a hydrogen. So that looks really good. Hydrogen bonding. We found one. CH4. If we draw that structure, it does not have nitrogen, oxygen, or hydrogen. So this one's pretty easy to eliminate as well. Just because it has hydrogen doesn't mean it has hydrogen bonds. Because that's not what we call these. We call the the nitrogen ones, hydrogen-nitrogen bonds, we call these carbon-hydrogen bonds. The hydrogen bonds, let me go to the molecules, with nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine connected to other hydrogens. Um, CH3OH looks like a good example. When we draw that, it looks just like the tetrahedral methane, CH3. OH. There is my requirement for a hydrogen bond. Um, we get this oxygen-hydrogen connection that when we get another CH3OH next to it, I'll just draw the skeleton structure here, CH3OH, this attraction right here will give me a hydrogen bond. The different two different molecules coming together to give me an attraction. So that looks pretty good. Uh, the last one is pretty tricky, the CH3OCH3. When we draw that, they're telling us there's a hydrogen here, CH3, attached to an oxygen, attached to another CH3. It has the workings of a hydrogen bond. I have hydrogen and oxygen, but you'll notice they're not connected to one another. In order for this to classify as a hydrogen bond, I need electronegativity differences to oxygens attached to the hydrogens. Here they're attached to the carbons. The hydrogens are all along the perimeter and do not qualify for hydrogen bonding. So yes, this is a polar molecule, um, even, even though it looks symmetrical, it's polar because these lone pairs on the oxygen, this is a bent shape around the middle. So this molecule as a whole is still bent. It doesn't, it's not totally symmetrical. This is a polar molecule, but it is not hydrogen bonding polar.
because the oxygen's not with the hydrogens. Um, and then when we get to properties, we can look at how does a property, what does that tell us about a boil or about a force? So argon is the boiling point is negative 189. We think of boiling, sometimes we think hot. Boiling just means liquid to gas. Um, so why is this so low? So low boiling points are an indicator of really weak forces. Um, how does this prove that London dispersion forces exist? Well, even though it, this is a single atom, and we kind of think about them as a, a ball, atoms is just a, a sphere, um, the fact that it can make a liquid at all means that something, when I hold these argons together, something is holding these together. And it's not our traditional polarity. So there's got to be something holding them together, otherwise they wouldn't, these forces, um, argon could never be a liquid. Um, it'd be impossible for nonpolar things to be anything other than gases unless there was a force that holds them together. So nonpolar substances still have a force that holds them together, albeit the weakest force possible. Um, xenon is negative 119 degrees Celsius. Why is it higher? Well, xenon is a bigger atom. So when I have xenon versus the argon, argon being a little bit smaller, it's about surface area and contact. Argon has that much contact, but xenon being a lot bigger maybe has a little bit more contact with its neighbors. That contact means a stronger force, and that word, if you caught it from your notes, is polarizable. It's how uh, squishy that large atom is. It's more easy uh, to be not symmetrical and have a, a stronger force to it. Bigger substances that are nonpolar, bigger substances are going to have stronger LDF forces. Uh, which brings us to predict the which one has the strongest force. You're going to be doing so much classification in this in this unit. Um, which one has the strongest force? Well, first you have to identify what the force is. These all say LDF. So we confirm all of these structures are nonpolar structures, individual atoms or symmetrical shapes. Um, and now our strongest forces are going to be the biggest atoms. Um, now we need to be careful here. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a toss-up. Hydrogen we can kind of rule out. Um, CH4 looks like it has the most atoms, but if you think about how many shells these have, uh, carbon only has two shells, and the hydrogens are really tiny. So this is actually, this might be one of the smaller ones in the group. You're tempted to say that CH4 is bigger, uh, but we have to compare the shells and the atom sizes also. Krypton is out because xenon is just a lot bigger. Um, xenon is definitely has the most shells with six, but then our bromines, even though they, they have one less shell each than xenon, there are two bromines. So while the individual bromine atom is smaller, our Br2 is probably the strongest, uh, the largest of this group and has the strongest LDF forces. Um, one quick confirmation for that, you can always look at the phases of these substances to see, um, to confirm the strength of their forces. Bromine is actually a liquid on the periodic table at room temperature, where xenon is a gas. That must mean that the bromine has stronger forces. This is a really good real-world analogy because if it exists as a liquid, it must be stronger. Those properties really tell you about the forces in a direct way. Um, same exercise, identify the dominant force in each of the following molecules. So we just need a list of classifications. Um, H2O is our typical hydrogen bonding. I don't want to go all the way back, but remember, these are not bonds. H2S is the same shape. It's dipole-dipole. SH4 is going to be a tetrahedral molecule. Um, 
which is nonpolar. So this is going to be, I don't want to write nonpolar. I want to write it has LDF forces when some of them come together. Um, if you want to pause this and figure out the rest of these and then kind of confirm them, this will be a good thing to do. You can always start and stop these along the way. Carbon dioxide is nonpolar, so we will do LDF for those. Methane is nonpolar, that'll be LDF forces. C4H10, um, we casually say that all hydrocarbons are nonpolar. If oxygens get in there, they're usually a little bit polar. If they get long enough, they can actually have polar ends and nonpolar ends, and you have some biology examples lipids, uh, of things that have nonpolar ends and polar ends, cell walls, and lots of things. Um, organic chemistry and biology really lends itself to this idea. Nitrogen, uh, diatomic, nonpolar, is LDF. Krypton, individual atoms, nonpolar, LDF. Um, we will make an exception. We'll say non-metals, non individual atoms that are non-metals will have LDF forces. Metallic things will do something else later on. CH3, CH3, OH. That OH there is going to give us our hydrogen bond. HF, um, that fluorine there, that's going to give us our hydrogen bond, which makes this a really, really strong um, attraction because it's really, really strong differences in electronegativities and polarity, um, which lends itself to being a weak acid because it doesn't dissociate well because the bond is so strong. HBr, polar, but it's going to be dipole-dipole forces because it does not have hydrogen bonding and it's not symmetrical. It's linear, but it's not symmetrical because the atoms are different. Um, NaCl, it's not symmetrical, but if you're paying attention, intermolecular forces are only for covalent molecules. This is not covalent. Ionic substances are still ionic. We'll talk about that more when we do solids. Uh, but don't lose sight of the simple things. Um, covalent molecules come together with intermolecular forces. Um, remember we said when we got to ionic things, they just formed giant lattices. That's, that's a little different because those are bonds. Okay, lowest to highest boiling point. So this is where we can start using forces to rank properties. So if we get there, um, lots of classifications here. Um, C2H6 has London dispersion forces. F2 has London dispersion forces. And then NH3 has hydrogen bonding. Um, so if we want to put them from the lowest to highest melting point, we want them from the weakest to the strongest. And when you're writing an essay or a comparison, this is a really good point. You need to state that this means weakest to strongest. Then you need to rank them, and then you need to justify your ranking. So the hydrogen bonding ones are going to be the strongest, NH3. Uh, the strongest forces will be the most resistant to spreading out. They will be the highest boiling points. The weakest ones are, they're both LDF. We need the smallest ones first, which is going to be fluorine, because smaller atoms are less polarizable, if you remember that vocab word. Um, and then C2H6 is going to be in the middle. Um, if we do that again, looking across the rows here, the lowest point is going to be the weakest force in each category. Um, the weakest one, these are all LDF forces. The weakest one is going to be the smallest, which looks to be oxygen. Um, in the next category, um, krypton Krypton's a little bigger. It might be close, but um, I'm going to go with oxygen on this one. Uh, the next category, we have to. They all have different forces. Um, the lowest ones we're looking for LDF forces, which are going to give me carbon dioxide and argon because the HCl is going to be dipole, and then water is going to be hydrogen bonding. So of these, CO2 and argon, we're probably looking at argon, um, but again, you'd, we could look at forces here, to uh, boiling points and other properties to confirm these, but argon looks to be a little smaller than CO2, just because we're getting more and more molecules there. And you really want to be able to rank and classify all of these intermolecular forces. London dispersion, dipole-dipole, and hydrogen bonding.